So uh, today I'm going to talk about some uh, applications of Bayesian networks uh, we developed in uh, systems biology. And here for the record, you see my uh, email, so you can contact me later if you want. And then this is our uh, lab uh, website. Um, what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna briefly talk about the research areas bioinformatics uh, deals with to give you a big picture overview and then uh, briefly mention uh, networks, probabilistic networks and what Bayesian networks do. And then move on to two applications, as I said, that uh, we use Bayesian networks in uh, systems biology. One is where we try to understand pathways active in a given experimental setting. The other is where we develop or uh, calculate interaction networks given experimental data and external knowledge. Uh, all right, so I define bioinformatics as a, a management and analysis information system for life sciences. And then there are roughly four areas bioinformatic works on. And, and these areas also coincide with the chronological order of the research areas that are in bioinformatics. The first one is protein structure prediction. And uh, this was maybe could date back all the way to uh, 60s or 70s because the first macromolecules that were sequenced were proteins. They weren't uh, RNA or DNA. And this is based on unfinsense conjecture which says given the primary sequence of a protein, the amino acid sequence, we should be able to predict its 3D structure and it has many application areas uh, like drug design. So there's a lot of work in bioinformatics that's just dedicated to the structural uh, bioinformatics. The second area is called molecular sequence analysis. And this area became popular in the 90s because then that's when we had more and more DNA and RNA sequencing coming up, uh, about. Uh, and this is roughly when I switched to bioinformatics, it was uh, about 97. I was, our expertise lied in uh, information theory, telecommunication, but with availability of DNA sequences, we tried to apply information theoretic approaches to DNA sequences, like what is the content of information in DNA? How can you characterize it? Uh, this area deals with problems like genome assembling. So given like short reads, how can you reconstruct a target DNA or phylogeny construction, right? Given say some set of sequences, how can you reconstruct the evolutionary history or things like homology search, like BLAST, I'm sure all of you use. So the algorithms in this molecular sequence analysis just go, starts with the, at the sequence level and then you know, builds on that. So this was very, uh, this maybe started mostly in the 90s, but then we had microarrays coming uh, in early 2000s because once this molecular sequence analysis phase gave us a bunch of gene sequences, now we were able to uh, produce probes, synthetic probes that represented those genes, put them on surfaces like silicon or glass slides, and due to using hybridization, uh, able to measure transcriptomics, for example, right? So with this area, we call functional genomics and proteomics. And now, of course, it, with mid 2000s, I would say with uh, sequencers and you know, next generation sequencers, uh, this uh, omic data generation shifted mostly to uh, sequencers. But the idea here is to measure tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of data points, uh, transcriptomics, proteomics, or you know, genomics, and then uh, do analysis like biomarker discovery, which is you know, like finding a set of uh, data points that can predict a clinical or biological field. So with 2000s, I would say this area became very, very uh, hot and popular and still is. But then came the systems biology phase I would say mostly the 2010s, where people tried to put these things together 
in the context of pathways and networks and using now with multi-omic approaches. So my story in bioinformatics actually started with molecular sequence analysis and then shifted to functional genomics when I moved to Boston. And the last uh, 10, 12 years, I would say I'm working more on uh, network-based analysis. And there are many uh, I mean, uh, challenges in bioinformatics because this area is at the intersection of two different disciplines, right? One on the left, as you see, um, computational scientists and on the right, life scientists. So we, as Louise was mentioning, uh, there is, uh, we, we come from slightly different worlds. And uh, just like, you know, how they say, when you buy a house, you have to uh, be pay attention to three things, uh, location, location, location. I would say the biggest obstacle in the field of bioinformatics is communication, communication and communication. Uh, as I said, because the researchers come from different worlds, uh, we need to have a common basis of uh, understanding. Uh, because uh, to be able to communicate, there should be a, a common language, right? And this cartoon kind of demonstrates that. So here we are seeing a, a code unquote computer guy there and uh, probably uh, their boss. And the boss says, hey, when a user takes a photo, uh, the app should check whether they're in a national park and the you know, computer person says, I mean, IT or whatever, the CS guy says, sure, it's a G easy GIS lookup, uh, GIS for uh, geographical information systems, right? You can locate where they are easily. So give me a few hours. And then they say, oh, and could you also check whether the photo is of a bird? And then yeah, he says, yeah, I'll need a research team in five years. Because it's a very much more complicated problem then, because then you use like image processing and artificial intelligence type of approaches. But for the person here, there are similar problems, right? So this is the type of communication we deal in bioinformatics. And some problems are easy to solve, but then others are really, really difficult to achieve. Uh, so for this understanding between these two domains, I decided to go with the concept of networks. I thought networks would provide a, a common ground that would let us communicate well. Uh, because networks are everywhere and we all kind of understand what they are. There is a lot of work in social sciences uh, because we have networks of people, right? Then you have computer networks. So there's a lot of work done in computer engineering. Then for in biology, we have networks of genes, and then you can think of many, many other uh, applications of networks. Uh, and when you look at the history of network theory or graph theory, it starts with Euler, the Swiss mathematician, uh, back in, I think it's like late 1500s or early 1600s, if I'm not wrong. You might have heard the story of Königsberg's bridges. Um, so Euler solved that problem, and that's when he started what we today know as graph theory, because he, there was a problem and he modeled it with nodes and links, and then he you know, kind of started doing math with graphs. But then you, there's a huge silence uh, for like 300 years uh, until, uh, 1900s, where we have uh, where we have um, Erdős, the Hungarian mathematician Erdős and Renyi uh, deal with this problem. So they have a series of papers uh, that deals with uh, just a second. Okay. They have a series of papers on, on graph theory in the uh, in 1900s, uh, but still not much done in the field of network theory until late to uh, late 1900s, early 2000s. Okay, that's when we see much more work being focused on. However, 
most of the work done with networks were on uh, deterministic static networks. For example, the links are already either there or not. And then the, you know, there were ideas like degree distribution, clustering coefficients. The whole theory was built on deterministic static networks. But I think, uh, you know, life is stochastic, right? So I thought we should kind of move away from these static deterministic networks and uh, deal with probabilistic networks, right? And this cartoon, uh, I'm hoping to, to demonstrate that. So here we have a guy on the left who looks like either, you know, a doctor or a scientist and he says to this guy on the right, hey, lifelong smokers have a one in two chance of dying from smoking related diseases. And the guy on the right says, oh, it'll never happen to me. And then he says, oh, the odds of winning the Powerball lottery are 80 million to one. And says, oh, this could be my lucky day. And he, he purchased a ticket. And when I show this cartoon, I say, hey, I used to be this guy on the right. So <laughs> I used to smoke. And I did buy lottery tickets. So life is stochastic. We all know there is probabilistic uh, sides to events, but how do we perceive it, right? How do we perceive probability? Because if you look at this guy on the right, he doesn't make logical choices. So his perception of probability uh, is pretty different than maybe your perception of probability, right? Okay, so then if you look at how we understand probability, there are three different ways that we perceive it. And I, I'm gonna demonstrate this with three questions okay, that I'm gonna ask to you and you can answer if you like. So the first one is the deck of cards problem. So if I ask you, what is the probability of drawing a jack of hearts? Uh, what would your answer be? You would probably say it's one over 52 because there are 52 cards. And this is one way we perceive probability through what we call equiprobable events, or this is sometimes called principle of indifference, right? So we, we kind of understand this probability. But then if I ask you the following question, uh, here is a, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, you can move stuff when it's the laser pointer. Okay, that's better. So the, the next question is this. So here you have a thumbtack and you throw, toss it up in the air. If it falls like this, we call it heads. And if it falls like this, we call it tails. And I ask you, what is the probability of getting heads? Okay. So apparently you couldn't answer this with the approach on the left because they're not equally probable events probably, right? And you wouldn't say one half, but how would you answer this question? One way we could approach this is through experiments, right? You could say, okay, I don't, I can't, well, if you could calculate all the physical models of, you know, the air dynamics, blah, blah, maybe you could model it and calculate it, you know, computationally. But the better approach, I would say, is maybe through experimentation, right? You could argue, hey, I could toss it 10,000 times, and if it landed the heads 2,137 times, for example, I would say the probability of heads is 0 0.2137. So we call this the relative frequency approach, right? This is the second way we perceive, we understand probability through, you know, doing random experiments of the same thing and then, uh, you know, counting the frequency. But how about a soccer game? Now, let's say there's a game and there's one coming up. Uh, I'm sure Luis follows the Champions League. Uh, Liverpool and Atletico Madrid are playing next Wednesday. So how about when I ask you, what is the probability that Liverpool is going to win this game? So this is a different uh, beast now, right? Because you can't answer it with this principle of indifference, again, it's not you know, one half, 
but you can't answer it with the relative frequency approach either because you can have them uh, play the same game 10,000 times under the same conditions. Okay. So what's happening here is actually when you give me a probability, you are representing a degree of belief. And you could say, okay, I think the probability that Liverpool is going to win is 65%. What do you base that on? Actually, in the back, you are running a Bayesian network. Okay, that's why Bayesian networks are also called belief networks. Now, your belief of Liverpool winning depends on a number of random variables, actually. For example, if the game is in Liverpool's uh, stadium or in Madrid, right? Or if the best player in or good high top ranked players in Liverpool are uh, injured or not, if, if the coach is uh, is like banned to to be in the on the pitch or not? There, or is it gonna be, how, how the weather gonna be? So there are many many random variables which are also interconnected, right? Actually, your brain kind of processes all this information and then comes up with a number, right? That that probability. So we use Bayesian networks to model this, right? So what we do is we get a number of random variables. You can think of as events. For example, today it's raining is a random variable, right? It, rain, it would rain with a probability, not rain with a probability, etc. But not only do we uh, show them as a graph, we show interconnectedness between these random variables, which uh, depicts the conditional dependency between them. Okay, So I will try to show this with a famous example. So here are five random variables, and they are represented by nodes here on the right. So H is history of smoking. So it is either one or zero, all of these. B is bronchitis being present or not. L is lung cancer being present or not. F is fatigue being present or not, and C is the chest X-ray being present or not. Now, and here I give you the structure of the network already. We call this a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Uh, Bayesian networks only work for DAGs. And the, the only uh, rule of the Bayesian network is every node is independent of its non-descendants given its parents. That's the only rule governing the Bayesian networks. But even, you know, you, you don't go to the details, you see some sort of a structure and influence between these random variables. Uh, there are three main things we can do with Bayesian networks. Uh, one is called structure learning. What this means is the following. Uh, assume we collect data for these five random variables for 50,000 patients in Europe. Okay, so somebody just recorded this. When a patient came, one, zero, one, zero, if the history of smoking is there, he, he, they put a one. You know, if the chest x ray was positive, they negative, they put a zero, etc. So assume a, an Excel sheet where the columns are these random variables, H, V, L, F, C, and the rows are patients, right? And there's one, zero, one, zero. And there are 50,000 rows. So with structured learning, we dump this data to our algorithm and the algorithm outputs this network on the right, right? So it takes data and gives us the structure of the network for those random variables. So this is one thing we can do with Bayesian networks. Another thing we can do is called instantiation. After you learn your network, what, and we call it parameter learning, say with those 50,000 patient data, we learn this network, not only the structure, but also the, the distribution for every node, then we can do instantiation, which is uh, setting the values of a subset of nodes and then asking the probability of the remaining nodes. So you can do this one versus all. For example, you can now, after the network is learned, you can say, hey, look, I now have a patient where history of smoking is one, bronchitis is absent, zero, fatigue is absent, zero, but chest x-ray is positive one, what is the probability of F? 
And what is the probability that this, per this patient has lung cancer? We can do this in Bayesian networks and the algorithm will spit out a probability. It says, oh, if it is uh, one, zero, zero, one for these four random variables, the probability of L being one is 0.67, right? We call this instantiation. And the third thing we can do with Bayesian networks is called fitness. And what this does is, let's say you gave me this network for European patients, but now I have data from patients from the US, say 10,000 patients against same you know, Excel file structure. And what I'm curious is if this data fits this network. In other words, if the data from the US population follows as the same dependency structure, and we have algorithms for this too. If we spit out a score in the end, and if you want to get a significant, oh yeah, the, we could say something, I guess, do the US data also fits this dependency structure we see in Europe or not, All right? So let's keep these in mind because in our applications, these will come up. Structure learning, you can do structure learning, given data, learn the network. You can do instantiation with, from a learned network, uh, set up certain variables and then calculate the probability of remaining variables. And, or you can do fitness on a learned network or a given network, if a, another given data fits this network or not. So we took these ideas of Bayesian networks and applied, as I said, to two problems. Uh, one is called, what we call the Bayesian pathway analysis. This is basically the, our goal was to replace enrichment analysis. As you know, when we do omics, let's say uh, we're studying pancreatic cancer and we found 700 genes that are important in pancreatic cancer. And then you ask us, okay, what is the significance of these things? What are their functions? Then we do something like GSCA or gene ontology, right? We say, okay, they are overrepresented in this gene ontology category. So this gene ontology category is enriched. But that gene ontology category or a pathway in the enrichment analysis, we treat it just as a list of entries, right? So in a gene ontology category, say you have 35 genes. And then if a good number of your input genes are among those 35 genes, you call it an enriched category. But you don't take into account the uh, interaction between the genes in this gene ontology category or the path. So we thought we could improve this enrichment analysis where we identify these active pathways using the Bayesian network ideas with incorporating the topology of the pathway in our model. And the second thing we did was called Bayesian Network Pure, BMP, where we learn new interaction networks from experimental data, but also using existing external knowledge. So I'll try to uh, motivate you uh, with uh, how we're, we did these things and uh, show you some results. So the first one, uh, as I said, is an improvement on uh, very popular enrichment uh, uh, analysis where the, uh, the, the functional groups are either go categories or pathways or any other functional gene sets. But these approaches, as I said, treat the genes in the groups as lists. Our workflow tries to capture the topology of the pathway as well uh, before calling it active in a given experimental setting or not. And here is the workflow. So on the left, we start with biological pathway information. Say these are CAG pathways, right? We convert them to directed acyclic graphs where we only retain gene interactions. So now you can think of it already as a BN, a Bayesian network with a fixed structure. And here on the left, we get the high throughput data. You know, it could be gene expression, proteomic, anything where these nodes are represented. We do some pre-processing where, you know, usually with omic data, you have to deal with a lot of annotation, consolidation. There's typically multiple representations of the same data point. Uh, but we do some pre-processing where now this experimental data is made fitting to test on this DAG we got from the pathway. And here we use the third uh, uh, facet I talked about the BNs, which is fitness. Okay, what we do then is we check if this data fits to this network. 
because remember I said we could do it with DMs. And then if I have 300 human pathways, I do it for all of them. And we do some bootstrapping for significance assessments. And we do uh, multiple hypothesis testing correction and calculate an FDR value. But at the end of the day, given data, I convert all pathways to DMs and test if this data fits this pathway significantly. And then if it is, I say this pathway is active. So we uh, apply this to synthetic data. And as you see, uh, I'm not gonna go into the details, but on the left, uh, we tested data that doesn't fit to the network. That's what we call an ideal CPT. And we did not find significant p-values for the networks if, when we asked if the data fits the network. And on the right in pane B, we use data that fits the network and the algorithm was uh, quickly uh, able to capture this, uh, that the data fits the network significantly. It gave us p-values below 0.05. And we tested the context where we removed edges from, so we took a network, generated data from it, but then removed edges from the network and then asked if the data fits the network or remove nodes from the network and then ask if the data fits the network. And our approach, except for some uh, extreme cases, was pretty resilient to edge and node removal. And the idea for this last exercise is because known pathways can be incomplete or incorrect, right? So there could be some edges that are not correct or some nodes that are not in the pathway, right? In the background, the biology, generates that data based on a certain network, but let's say we are missing some of those nodes when we represent it in a cake pathway. So we wanted to test if, if the, the algorithm is robust to these instances and it seemed to be robust. And then we did another exercise where we took um, 60 known cake pathways and where 58 of them had were cyclic. And we generated gene expression data where we imposed only 25 of these 60 pathways to be active, okay? And this data we generated using this tool called Sintran. So at the end of the day, we get a synthetic gene expression data set for 20 tests and 20 uh, normal samples. Think of it as a cancer data set, for example, where we had about 2,200 synthetic genes and we added 4% noise level, right? So now the goal is, take this data and do an enrichment type of analysis and ask which uh, pathways of, which of those 60 pathways are enriched or active. When we did that with different uh, uh, enrichment analysis approaches like GSCA or SPIA uh, or global test, uh, DPA turned out to give us the uh, most accurate result, meaning, uh, how accurate these um, approaches were in calling these 25 pathways as active out of the 60 pathways. So, so we felt comfortable that we're comparable to existing methods. And then finally, we took, it this, to, we took this to real data and um, uh, Louis would remember we had John, John Young's data from, from Boston, right? We took that and other RCC data sets yeah. and uh, again, you know, <laughs> uh, tried to see which pathways were active in these RCC renal cell cancer data sets. And we got uh, BPA uh, for the clear cell renal cell carcinoma subtype because RCC has a bunch of subtypes like oncocytoma, uh, et cetera. Well, we took overlap of four CRC data sets these are the overlap of the pathways that BPA called active. And at the intersection of all four data sets, there were eight and six of these eight pathways uh, were uh, validated using an experimental proteomic approach to be uh, activated in RCC. So that also gave us a bit confidence that we are able to identify active pathways from real data. All right, so the second, that's BPA. The second approach, so in BPA, we have fixed networks, which are pathways coming from literature or you know, databases, they are fixed. I'm just trying to see if they're active in an experimental setting or not. The second approach we're using is called, it was, we, we wanted to learn networks from data. So this is not 
non database uh, based networks but i want to learn new interaction networks from uh, experimental data now one thing you have to be careful in artificial intelligence is what your algorithm is doing and then uh, this cartoon re represents that. Uh, so here on the left, we have a normal guy like us and asking this AI expert, hey, this is your machine learning system? And then the AI expert says, yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. And then this guy says, okay, what if the answers are wrong? Well, you just stir the pile until they start looking right. But, you know, this is pretty much <laughs> sums up um, a good uh, portion of the AI approaches because the systems get so complicated that we lose the handle of it. Like if you think of deep learning, we use convolutional neural nets, but then it really happens like this. there are many, many iterations running and then you lose your control over the parameters or what, or what the system is actually doing. And so we thought when we are learning networks from data, we have to have some guidance, you know, something to guide this approach uh, in a way that we understand. And we thought one of the ways to do it is to use, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to update this. This was the 2021. Is to use external knowledge, right? If I'm learning, or trying to build an interaction network from an experimental data, why should I solely rely on the experimental data? Why ignore all this scientific knowledge that is out there, right? So that was our motivation. We said, we're gonna use external knowledge when we build these interaction networks. And for example, if you go to the nucleic acids research database issue that comes up every January, uh, in the last one, uh, they had you know, 1,641 biological databases. And I encourage all of you to use this uh, data set. Now, but then the issue was, how do you incorporate external knowledge? There are many ways you can do it. I mean, you can build a network and say, okay, if this link exists in the database, I will strengthen it by some percentage. We didn't want to do it. We wanted to do this in a more uh, sophisticated way, if you will. And this is what we built. We, we built something called Bayesian Network Prior. What we did is, oh, let me start, let's take one step back. Our goal was, okay, when I, how do I say two genes interact based on external knowledge? Well, interaction is a stochastic event. If I'm gonna base it on external knowledge, there are many different experiments or evidence or databases that say they interact, some say they don't interact, right? Can I build a system that shows me the dependency structure among these evidence types and the event gene interaction? So we build a Bayesian network that reflects just that. And our initial uh, matrix was something like this. So here in the first column, you see gene pairs, so A and B. And then the other columns are external experimental evidence that tells us if these two genes interact or not. Okay, And then we added here a final column, gene interaction. And if there were two or more evidence types that said two genes interact, we called the gene interaction column true. Otherwise, we called it false. Now, this structure we called BMP. And we uh, con uh, collected data from many databases they, that represented 24 evidence types, and we had 16 million rows. Now, using this huge data matrix, we learned a Bayesian network. Okay? And here, the nodes of the Bayesian networks are evidence types, and one of the nodes is the gene interaction. Okay? And here's, this is not the final version, but this is one of the uh, uh, versions of the BMP we had. So we lo we're looking at something like this, and then we tested this with five-fold cross-validation, and it gave us a 94% uh, area under the curve accuracy. But what can this network uh, be used for? We're going to use it for the following. Now, 
I have a network that tells me if two genes interact based on external knowledge. Now, let's say you do an experiment and it is, I don't know, it is two hybrid experiment, okay? You, for these two genes, you plug in your value here, whether you, you know, assess the interact or not. And the remaining values come from the literature. And then we instantiate this network. Remember the second thing we could do with Bayesian network, instantiation. And then we ask the probability of this node at the top, which is gene interaction. So if you do a microarray experiment, you, you replace this node with your experimental value and ask this question if these two genes interact or not. So like this, for every pair of gene, we get a probability of them interacting based on external knowledge, and your experimental data. Okay, we call this the B matrix and came up with the following uh, structure where we here in the middle, you see the structure learn and I'm gonna skip the details and you know, I think I'm gonna wrap up in about two minutes. Uh, but here in the middle, we have the structured learning process. Okay, remember the first thing we could do with patient networks, you give me data, I learned the network. Now these are established methods. But they're still, again, I'm going to skip details. They're suboptimal because, you know, they maximize likelihood. But if you know the probability of graph, then you could maximize the a posteriori approach, which is the optimal one. What we did is we intervened classical structure learning processes with uh, this um, P of G. So as I said, it's hard to... Uh, explain without going into the details, but uh, the structured learning process kind of evaluates every candidate network one at a time. But if you know the probability of that network occurring, then you do an optimum, uh, optimum search process, okay? We did that, we fed to this machine in the middle, this P of G value, how? using our BMP. So you give us a network, we look at every pair of genes that are uh, linked in that candidate network uh, based on gene interaction probability and assess the P of G, okay? And in the end, we have a reconstructed network. And then here are some experimental results. So we took 23 human cake pathways, for example, and then uh, modeled them as Bayesian networks and uh, generated data uh, that follows the network structure and insert, uh, is introduced some uh, noise and learned the network first using regular structure learning approaches, which we call a, the flat, and second with the BMP approach. And there was a, a huge improvement um, on the simulated pathway data. So BMP-based approaches, we were about over 90% uh, AUC. Then we took again cake pathways, this time used Sintran to generate simulated microarray data. Uh, we used 10 control time tests with 10% noise and again, again learn the networks. One using you know, standard approaches that doesn't incorporate external knowledge, just regular structure learning. Second, uh, our approach where we incorporate external knowledge, the, the blue bars. Uh, and then again, we had improvement in almost every pathway as far as AUC of the networks goes. And finally, we took real microarray data, the RCC data we used in BPA, and then learned those uh, networks that are known to be associated with renal cell cancer. So we took only those genes and then tried to learn the network and then uh, tested how well we learned the true kick pathway. Uh, and again, the, the BMP approach uh, had significant improvement in AUC over other approaches. Uh, the flat approach, the, the, the one that doesn't use external knowledge. And here is an example of how a, uh, an output of this BMP approach looks. So here um, we learned the uh, glycose uh, amino glycan degradation pathway. Uh, uh, using the uh, renal cells cancer transcriptomic data. So this is a fixed uh, cake pathway, right? We take, only take those genes 
from the experience in data and ask our algorithm to find the network among these genes. And what you see here are the green arrows, uh, which are matching between the cake pathway and our learned uh, DAG. The red ones exist in the real cake pathway, but are missing in our learned DAG. And the blue ones uh, is discovered by our algorithm, but don't exist in the DAG. Our hypothesis is that these blue ones could be new hypothesis generating links, right? So they haven't been identified yet, but based on this experimental data, we believe such interactions exist. And here, for example, I went and searched PubMed for HPSCN GLB1, and there was a paper, for example, a recent one that showed uh, some association between these two genes. Then we took this idea to building interaction atlases, because BMP look forks for a small number of genes using a divide and conquer approach. First, clustering the expression data, learning networks for each cluster, finding representative genes in each cluster, building a map between these representative genes, and then merging the clusters, we are now able to generate a large scale into for tens of, not tens of thousands, but over 10,000 genes. We can build these interaction networks. And our future directions are applying to this, to multi-omic data, not only, and we have actually already published that paper, not only to gene data, but if you have genes, metabolites, lipids, proteins, for example, how do you combine them? Or can we take this idea and apply to um, metagenome, right? microbial world? Instead of our nodes being genes, what if they're bacteria now? And can I build interaction network among species? And finally, uh, we want to move on to time series data with, with these ideas. And I'd like to take my collaborators who helped with the, uh, the results I showed here. And these are the funding agencies that made this possible.